This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Jim Dietert, who is a professor at University of Virginia at the Darden School of Business, and he's also the author of uh, this book right here called um, Choosing Courage, the Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. Welcome, Jim. It's great to be here. Thank you, Greg. So uh, this book, um, I mean, this book, I, I think I think you can say that this book is really about helping people to cultivate a particular type of, of virtue, uh, a virtue in, in the workplace, although I think it, it probably extends to other aspects of, of your life. But you focus primarily on, on the workplace. And, you know, you highlight that um, while we're in business school, you know, we spend a lot of time learning about different types of tools for, you know, getting things done and doing things well. But, but none of those tools are really useful if you don't have the, the courage to, to put them into practice. And maybe what we need to do is spend a little bit more time helping people to cultivate that, that courage. Um, and I, I sometimes talk about this in my strategy class where I say, you know, you need strategic vision, but you also need strategic courage. But your view of courage extends well beyond, right, risk-taking. Uh, I think a lot of times we, we tell people in business school, you know, learn to take risks, but this is a very specific type of risk. Uh, uh, um, and so maybe we can start off by getting a definition, your, your definition you provide for what we think of as, as workplace courage. Sure. So, I mean, let's, let's keep it simple. I, I think of workplace courage as specific acts. So I'm not interested in some supposed personality type, and we can talk more about that later if you want, but I don't think there is a personality type. I'm talking about specific acts that people take that basically just meet in work contexts or work relevant actions that meet two criteria. They're done for a worthy cause, you know, sort of a good deed, uh, despite perceived risk. So risky, worthy acts. And, and you're right, that's that's a much broader range of actions than just say, you know, bold, strategic, innovative actions. It's lots and lots of everyday behaviors that we know are important that, that people uh, refrain from doing or don't do as fully or honestly as they should, right? Giving honest feedback to peers, uh, telling your subordinates the truth, um, challenging your boss on, on strategic issues, but also on sort of everyday interpersonal kinds of issues. So it's the array of things that people could and should do because they serve a worthy purpose, but often avoid because of risks. Now, when you say worthy purpose, I mean, is career advancement uh, a worthy purpose? I mean, sometimes, at least in the stories that you tell in the book, yeah. taking these courageous actions ultimately turns out to be good for the careers of the individuals who make those decisions. But there, there are circumstances where it, it actually sets you back, right? right career-wise, right? And I think you talk a bit about how you know, there are some things that are more important <laughs> than, you know, career advancement. So, I mean, is, 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 it, is it a win-win? I mean, or are we talking about trade-offs here, right, between personal advancement and, you know, doing the right thing? Well, I, I think there are two elements to that question. One is sort of who's the intended beneficiary of an act. So, you know, in many cases, it is the self and or others, and both are relevant. So, we take an issue... Let's say um, you're a female and you perceive that you're underpaid relative to your male peers uh, and therefore you go to speak up and advocate for that to be addressed. Uh, you might choose to frame that as, hey, this is about me being underpaid and I want that rectified. In that case, you are the sort of direct recipient should something positive happen. In other cases, you might feel that whether, it, whether you're personally uh, implicated or not, this is a broader systemic issue about how men versus women are paid. And so you go to sort of say, hey, I would like a serious study on this done, and I know it's important for us to do right by this. So, so one aspect is sort of who are you speaking up or taking action on behalf? Sometimes it's self, sometimes it's other, sometimes it can be both. Um, we, you know, we've done some basic research uh, and looked into sort of how do others view the courageousness of an action when it seems to be taken for the self versus others. And in general, both types of acts, assuming they're sort of a noble, worthy cause, um, are accorded sort of the, the label, the attribution of courage. Probably not surprisingly, the more it is other oriented, the more people appreciate it and respect it as courageous. And in the extreme, obviously, right? Like 
if I go speak up to the boss about uh, you know modifying the work schedule uh, because it would be more convenient for my golf game, then uh, it's not seen as a particularly worthy uh, endeavor relative to, for example, people's ability to meet family obligations. So one is self versus other. The other aspect you said is is somewhat distinct, which is whether you're speaking up on behalf of yourself or somebody else, sort of what happens, right? And and the reality is that often the consequences can be a mix of, I might make the world better for other people, for our clients, for the world as a whole, uh, and I might suffer great personal harm. Uh, conversely, my actions might in fact lead to some positive outcome for me as well. So. Indeed, oftentimes um, we have to be willing to say the worthy purpose um, is sufficiently worthy that I will try to make it better, even if there are potential harms that accrue to me. Right. And so I think part of your argument is that, you know, you cannot be making these decisions necessarily in, in the moment, right? You have to have some kind of background sense of what constitutes a, a worthy cause. Right, uh, and because if you're if you're making that decision in the moment, it's going to be very easy to kind of make take the easy route, right? Um, and and so this is the importance of habit. So you use this term when I mean, you talk about the importance of a uh, habit of 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 courage. Um, and I, I love this example. I think I forget who you were quoting, but you said something like, um, uh, you know, if if <laughs> you you um, if if you haven't been doing it all along, it's it's going to be very hard to to to, to do it on demand, right? So do we need to exercise our, our courage muscle? You use the term courage fitness, and I, I love this idea, right? Going to the courage gym, you know, to, to, to get, you know, courage fitness. Um, how does one go about getting courage fitness? Yeah, I mean, you're talking about the quote by the late um, Colonel Eric Kale, yeah, who said, look, the... <laughs> The idea that you're going to suddenly be courageous in those, you know, critical 30 seconds when you haven't gotten ready for the prior 10 years is cowardly. Uh, and, you know, I actually think what what he is stating, and it, it's absolutely my view, you know, now having worked carefully on this for 20 years, that competent courage, right, not just choosing to speak up or or take a prudent risk. Uh, but doing it in a way that has the best odds of convincing somebody else to act, right? Whether that be to invest or to listen to your idea, to take action, to change their own behavior. To to achieve those objectives isn't just about, you know, the willingness to accept the risk and therefore take action. It's about doing it in a way that people respond positively or as positively as possible. And that requires skill. And you know, as we know about all skills, whether we're talking about, you know, in the music domain, the sports domain, you aren't born with the skills to play brilliant tennis or play brilliant violin. You work at the development of those skills. And, you know, I think a lot of what I do in my work is to help people sort of understand the myths about courage and courageous action versus the reality. And one of the myths is that there's some sort of select few that are born without fear or born with this capacity to be skilled. And it's just not true. Um, we have to decide, hey, I want to be a better ally. I want to help the firm more. I want to take care of our those we serve better. And therefore, I will take the practice steps to get better at this. I will work at this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have um, at the high school business, we have this uh, defining principle called question the status quo. You know, we have a couple others. And, yep. you know, we try to incorporate it into all of our teaching. But but I always worry, you know, by teaching these principles, are we just sending our students out on, on a suicide mission, right? I mean, right? Doesn't there, to some degree, have to be a fit between the courage you bring to the table and kind of the organizational capacity to respond to that, that courage? Um, you know, because there are going to be situations where the, the courage is, is going to simply... Uh, backfire. So, you yeah. know, part of this is about an accurate assessment of kind of what to do and when and, and whether it's it's going to work, right? And, and you say that people yeah. oftentimes have very inaccurate uh, assessments. They tend to, I guess, overestimate the likelihood of, of negative blowback. 
Yeah. So, so, you know, let's unpack that. Let me one. Um, yeah, as you know, I have a whole chapter in the book about choosing your battles. That's right. Uh, certainly it is the case that we can't, uh, we can't slash shouldn't, uh, you know, speak up, stand out every single time on every issue that's upsetting or could be improved. Uh, that almost certainly is going to be ineffective. So yeah, we have to choose our battles. You know, on the other hand, uh, if we take that to the opposite extreme and say, fit means I can do it with relative certainty that I won't harm myself and that it will be well received and acted on, well, then actually you're not talking about courageous actions anymore because once that much risk is reduced, it no longer meets the definition of a risky worthy act. And so, you know, yes, we have to choose our battles. Yes, uh, sometimes, you know, the, the most courageous action a person can take is to leave an environment because it's clear it's not going to, they're not going to be able to sort of live according to their values. But I think we have to leave in the reality that in most environments, um, there's still going to be some risk involved. And so again, going back to this notion of skill building, you know, again, what I'm really clear about is that if you ask people it's like, hey, you know, hey, I know this is a challenge or, or a, a prompt to those listening to this, you know, call to mind the first instance of courageous action in your organization. And what I know generally gets recalled is the biggest, scariest, you know, that person worked here and then a month later they didn't anymore or, you know, the whistleblowing that we read about in the Wall Street Journal. We have this sort of this notion that courageous action are these huge career ending acts of martyrdom. And what I think we, we have to do is begin to challenge that notion and say, hey, people don't lose their job because they finally give a subordinate uh, an honest performance evaluation. That's hard to do. People don't generally lose their job because when, you know, coworkers are missing deadlines or being inappropriate, we step in and say, hey, that's not cool. There are so many instances where, yeah, we do overestimate the risks. Um, sure, could there be a career consequence? Could there be a social consequence? Yes. Is it as likely as we think? Often not. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've read a lot over the years and thought a lot about, like, why do we tend to overestimate risk? And, yeah, I think there's a very biological evolutionary reason. I mean, take social risks. Why are people so terrified of losing their friendships, you know, being cast out, being ostracized? Well, for most of our time on Earth, we lived in these small clans or tribes. The daily task was actually physical survival, right? Are we going to eat enough? Are we not going to get attacked by a bear uh, or, or a rival? And in those contexts, if you were cast out, you were going to die and you were going to die soon. So it's not illogical that our brain has developed a tendency to actually amplify actual risk, right? To make us think it's larger. And I think part of our challenge is, is slowing down the processing enough to say, what's the real risk involved here? And you know, you talked about this difference between just jumping in in the moment versus having had the foresight to think things through. And I think part of that slowing down involves learning to challenge ourselves and get clarity on like, yeah, when is this a real risk? And when might it be a little bit painful, but am I almost certainly going to be just fine? Yeah. I mean, part of this is, I mean, potentially a question of um, psychological uh, bias, right? So in, you know, we talk about yeah. narrow framing. So, so on the one hand, it could be that you overestimate the riskiness. On the other hand, it could be that you, you underestimate the extent to which you're, portfolio is, you know, diversified, right? <laughs> You're going to have a bunch of these different opportunities and that while yes, they may individually be risky. If you, if you do this a lot, right, most of the time it's going to work out well. So is it, is it, is it, do we narrowly frame these, these risky situations? I think we narrowly frame it in particular in the direction you mentioned. Again, if you think about, again, one of the most robust psychological findings in literature is that bad is stronger than good. And so, you know, if if I had some camera that actually recorded every time you spoke up in any context, probably what we would find is that 93% of the time it was just fine or positive. The problem is the way your brain encodes is that it is hyper attuned to those 7% where it didn't go so well. 
Uh, and so, you know, again, that's part of the challenge. Again, if I go in organizations, I say, hey, tell me an urban myth or a legend about, you know, speaking up, for example. Very few people tell the story about, you know, we were in this in this broad context talking about R&D strategy and a scientist stood up and said, you know, we, we, we're we missing the ball here. We need to move resources to this. And they got promoted and celebrated for having the courage to do this. No, the story is that guy challenged the R&D president and didn't work here the following week. And so we, we have to, yeah, I think, accept that there is this huge portfolio, not just of opportunities, but also times that we or others actually do it. And most of the time, we don't encode particularly strongly the mundane ones that went just fine. Right. What I found interesting is this divergence between people's willingness to take physical risks and and their unwillingness to take social risks. So even in like the military, there are people that will jump on a grenade before yeah. they'll challenge their commanding officer, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, do you think part of that is because we all know, right, how to recognize physical courage when we see it? And so when someone does rush into the burning building, no one is going to say, oh, you know, that guy's not a team player, right? They're all going to say, yeah, that's courageous. Whereas when somebody does something courageous in the organizational context, it's sufficiently ambiguous that, you know, some people could spin it as something uh, negative for the organization, right? Um, that whoever controls the narrative can basically um, make that person look good or bad, right? I mean, if everyone in the organization agrees that this person being courageous and then they get fired, then it's going to create a lot of unrest within the organization. But if, if the person who fires them can convince the rest of the organization that this person was a bad apple or something like that, uh, then you know, the, the person will, will experience negative consequences without, without any, um, <laughs> you know, with, without any consequences for the, the, the person who's, who's, who's doing the bad act, right? Yeah. I mean, I may be a little bit more pessimistic in, in, in the sense that I think there are plenty of contexts where, you know, a leader who feels threatened by, you know, the courageous voice of somebody, um, you know, takes a harsh action and the majority of people around that leader are quite clear that that was a courageous action and power ruled the day. You know, that said, I do agree with you. I think the military is a good example. You know, firefighting would be a good example, but I'll also, and I'll explain why in a second, um, you know, pharmaceutical biotech R and D, for example, is another example where when people are doing um, something that is unquestionably defined as their role, they often have cover. So, you know, firefighters, military personnel are supposed to go into danger. It's their job, right? Um, conversely, it's not necessarily, and in fact, it often historically has not been your job to disagree with a superior in the chain of command in the military, right? So, there's the difference between whether it's a role or not. You know, if you look in pharma and biotech, what I've learned over the years is that often folks will say, look, if what we're talking about is drug safety, for example, or risk, it's absolutely safe to speak up. In fact, you'd get fired if you didn't speak up about that. Um, but then again, when you move into other domains, it can become quite risky again. So I think there are domains where the risk is defined into, and in fact, in those contexts, if you're to say, hey, you were so physically brave, they were, you were, you're courageous, they'd say, no, I wasn't, I was just doing my job. So I think that's one element. The other element, particularly, I think we have to keep in mind in, it's more obvious in, in physical domains, like, you know, firefighting or military context. Um, one, one of the reasons they train so intensely is precisely to increase the capacity to act skillfully despite fear. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what appears horribly frightening and risky and therefore courageous to us doesn't feel so much so to them. Uh, you know, in the same way, right, folks who, you know, can get up on stage and give a huge speech or whatever. For many of us, that looks horrifying. Uh, for those folks who have practiced it many, many times, they may not particularly see it as challenging or difficult. Right. Now, a lot of people are in organizations where they have toxic leaders, right? There's toxic colleagues, right? There's people that are, that are bad actors. Um, and, and it's often very difficult to kind of uproot those people or, or confront them. I've done a number of podcasts on this. And 
you know, one of the reasons why is that people like that, they're particularly skilled at, you know, diffusing any kind of challenges to their, to their authority. Um, And it made me think of warfare, right? You know, when you have a battle out in a field with two armies, you know, then you either win or you lose. But if it's kind of guerrilla warfare, then it's, it's, it's much more difficult, right? So a lot of times you describe these scenarios where people are at a meeting and, and somebody does something and the courageous person stands up at the meeting and confronts the, the bad actor. And then, of course, the whole or organization and the audience has to kind of figure out, right, who to side with. But if, if, if all the meetings are taking place in private, is, there, is that a different type of, of, of courage to confront in plain view versus to confront in the privacy of an office? Well, one thing that's certainly different about it is, I mean, we know this from lots of of the work we've done, is that people find it um, much harder, much more courageous to speak up in public than in private. And Mm -hmm. in fact, a lot of us kind of walk around with an internalized rule that says, you know, you don't speak up in public. And I think, you know, one of the the challenges of, of holding that belief, and, and I think it's a very dominant belief in organizations, you know, many, many bosses will say, well, you can, you can tell me what's wrong, you can confront me, you can give me your ideas, but don't surprise me, don't catch me off guard, mm-hmm. um, don't confront me in public. And, and what I think, and this is something that Amy Edmondson and I have, you know, who writes a lot about psychological safety, have talked a lot about, you know, that may be a sort of second best, it's better than not getting the information, uh, but but ultimately, when people walk around saying, hey, we all just sat here and watched something go wrong and none of us said anything and maybe somebody went in private and did it, the message that conveys about the culture is it's not safe. We're not capable of having public discussions. We're not capable of you know, public apologies, public ownership. And so, yeah, sometimes I think you can solve problems by doing it privately, but the message um, is that it's unsafe. And I think you know, a tr- in a true learning culture, nobody has to pretend they're perfect and nobody has to pretend that they can't be corrected in public. Yeah, there's some interesting work on information cascades, right, where, you know, you might have a whole group of people who all think the same thing, but they don't say anything. And once a critical mass of people start saying it, then everybody, you know, reveals their, their true beliefs. Yeah. But to be the first person to stand up and say that, I mean... That that requires the kind of courage I think that you talk about, um, and so you know that's going to be much more difficult than being the second or third or fourth person to to pile on. Yeah, I mean that's certainly true. We know that like from right very old like groupthink type literature or you know these sort of false consensus paradigms where yeah all it often takes is just a second or a third person to join in and then it becomes much much easier to do it, which is why it makes that first person's action you know, I think more noteworthy and courageous and also rare. Um, And and I will say, you know, sadly, the the thing that uh, many of the courageous people I've interviewed over the years um, say, and in particular, let's say in more whistleblowing kind of cases, more extreme cases, report as the most disappointing thing of all. They they will tell you like, look, I anticipated that the person I spoke up to was not going to respond well. What they are most disappointed and hurt by is that the many other people they knew agreed with them because they had told them in private they agreed with them, um, sat silently mm-hmm. and did not join in, did not stand with them um, when they went first. And I think, you know, that's something for us all to really think about. Like, it's one thing to tell ourselves a story about how I'm not going to be the sort of leader of the pack. I think it's a whole nother thing to sort of explain away why when someone has taken that risk and you agree, you won't even be the third or the fourth or the sixth person to support them. Now, when you go on the job market, let's say that first person <laughs> comes forward and, and they, they're the tip of the spear and, and it doesn't end well for them. Um, organizations say that they want to recruit people who are innovators, people that um, are kind of think differently and have courage, but I mean, it doesn't look good on your CV, right, to say, hey, you know, I, I, I didn't get along with my boss, and so, you know, now I'm on the job market, right? Like, that's usually interpreted as, hey, this person is a troublemaker, this person's not going to get along with their new boss. Even if the new organization is, is better run, 
th they're still going to be a little suspicious of this person, right? So, I mean, how how can you, as as a recruiter, would it make sense for you to go and look for people that have run into these difficulties? Because that means that they they haven't figured out a way to to change the organization from within. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's a it's a hard question because you know I, I find and and I think you know your question implies that we, we all sort of know that there's this you know call it what you want dis you know disconnect maybe all the way you know to, to hypocrisy between organizations say yeah we want people who speak truth to power we want innovators we want creative minds we want people who don't just go along I mean very few organizations say anything other than that today uh, and yet, you're exactly right. Um, it's to be known as someone who has previously spoken up, to has previously done that, can be a huge uh, black mark. I, I can't remember the specific um, author of this piece, but I, th I thought it was brilliant in saying, you know, there are, there are a set of known whistleblowers in the U.S. who you know, blew the whistle on something and won their case. In other words, unquestionably were... Um, were found in the system, the legal system, to have had a legitimate case where they were speaking up about a true crime, uh, a true harm to shareholders, right? A true, a true risk to people's health or well-being. So these are vindicated uh, whistleblowers. And this, what this person said is, um, and then you look. So that exists; those people exist out there. But when you look at boards of directors, there's some surveys of of uh, done by boards and. Um, courage is the number one trait that boards say they want on their boards. Um, and what this person was pointing out is courage is the number one desired trait on boards. And there is not a single vindicated whistleblower on a board in the U.S. Fortune 500. And pointing out just this huge inconsistency between saying we value a certain kind of person and the reality then of not wanting them. And... Yeah, I, I mean, my personal view on if you'd say, well, how, if you were going to help a recruiter sort out the difference between sort of a chronic troublemaker versus a legitimate, you know, truth teller who simply wanted to sort of drew what's right and improve the organization, I think to me it's a matter of patterning, right? So if a person has had a pattern of successful jobs they've been in for some time, and then has a single situation where they are able to explain, you know, this this is what it, why it didn't work out and why. That to me is different than a person who's had, you know, seven jobs in the last six years um, and for whom every single organization has somehow been toxic and had a terrible boss. And, um, you know, at some point when you're the only consistent thing in a pattern of different situations, you're the problem. Right. What I like, there was an experiment, I think, that you ran where you described a situation and there were a whole bunch of different stakeholders and uh, and people were asked to role play and they were asked, you know, do you think this act is, is courageous? And, you know, most people said, yeah, this act is courageous, but the person who was inhabiting the role of the one who was being confronted <laughs> didn't see it that way. Um, so, yeah, so, this, so, you know, you don't see it as courageous when, when someone is, is coming after you, right? No, you tend to see it in, in that particular scenario, but it mirrors the, the world. Um, if you're the boss in that scenario, you tend to see it as insubordinate, inappropriate, disloyal. Yeah, you, you label it as dumb. Uh, whereas everybody else says, no, it was courageous. It was important. It was for a worthwhile reason, and it was risky. And so, you know, again, if you go back to your, well, let's say you're a recruiter, you're an organization, and you're considering a person. I mean, that to me is the lesson, is to say, um, if that person is, you know, correct that, hey, I was a functional human being, I simply believed it was important to speak up about or take a prudent risk on this issue, then there should be lots of people in that person's prior organization who they would be willing to have you go talk to who would say, yeah, it wasn't Jim. It was the reality that this person was threatened or angered by their appropriate behavior. Because now you, most people who aren't the target of courageous action are able to see it and recognize it. Well, you describe some situations where people will go above the heads of their boss to their boss's boss, right, to report bad behavior. 
Um, so I'm, I'm interviewing a CEO of uh, a former CEO of, of a bank, and, and he wrote a book on leadership. And he said that in his organization, that was not allowed, right? That, you know, you, you had to work things out with your own boss. And if you went around the boss, then you, you were considered in violation of, of corporate culture. Um, I, I think that's, that's fairly common, right? I mean, it's seen as, as certainly in the military, right? It's seen as, uh, you know, going around the chain of command. No um, is there, is there, are there trade-offs there? I mean, under what circumstances should leadership in, encourage that? I mean, my, my view is that if, if the, if the boss's boss isn't asking for information, then they don't want it. Right. And, and they, they don't view it positively. Yeah, I agree. With, I agree with that statement often. Uh, and I would add, I mean, in many cases, right, the skip level bosses are simply too swamped with the span of control they have to, to be thinking about the hundreds and hundreds of people below them, right? I, I think, though, more generally, it's absolutely true. There are not very many organizations where this uh, is done or received well. It's also another area where I think there's a difference between what people say and then the reality. So many organizations nowadays realize you know, hey, whether it's because we might have some problems in the managerial ranks below us, or actually just more simply because uh, those folks are also busy and forget to tell us something, or they may have a different filter for what's important than we would if we heard it. I mean, there are lots of innocuous reasons also why skip level leaders would want to hear what's happening down on the front lines, right? It doesn't have to be problematic. So I, I think what we do know is that there's such an ingrained sense of hierarchy in the vast majority of us by the time we get into the world of work that it is viewed as inherently risky. And the places where I've seen it work successfully are places that have two things in place. One, because they recognize it'll be inherently difficult or challenging, they set up specific mechanisms, right? So this can be, you know, we have uh, cookies and coffee chats. So people show up unannounced, and they invite, you know, they walk around unplanned and say, hey, how about, do you have time? Do you have time? Do you have time? Let's go grab cookie and coffee. So they have specific, right? It could be, you know, Friday free lunch. You just have to bring an idea. So I think companies that do this well have mechanisms for, for encouraging it to happen, for facilitating it. And then the second thing they have is they actually have stories that people know pretty widely of. Yeah, you know, Greg's my boss. And then I, I went to a cookie chat. Um... And he so tried to interfere, he, he tried to threaten me, or he tried to remind me not to say something, or he tried to find out, um, and Greg got fired. So right. there has to be um, a sense that if I tell the truth two or three levels up, I'm not going to get it from my direct boss. And there have to be sort of mechanisms in place to make that clear. And frankly, there have to be some urban legends about the, the boss is getting in trouble. So I think... Uh... Organizational design, then the implications would be: How do you design an organization where less courage is needed? Right? I mean, yeah. that's sort of the, the idea. Uh, so, you know, apart from setting in place mechanisms for better communication, are, are there any other ways that we can do this? I always think in business school we're we're teaching people how to be effective leaders, but we're also trying to teach them how to create organizations that, that unlock the effectiveness of the people within the organization. So, you yeah. know, what would it mean to have an organization that didn't require so much courage? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, nowadays it's become somewhat common. People, you know, people, you even see some companies that have as slogans, like their taglines are like, we encourage courage. And I, I say, I tell leaders like, Sorry, I think you got that exactly wrong. Um, because if you are walking around as a leader, particularly a senior leader, and you're encouraging courage, I mean, e effectively what you're saying is, um, hey, folks, I'm well aware of the fact that it's not psychologically safe around here. I don't intend to fix that or do anything about that. So I hope you buck up and, uh, you know, do the hard thing anyway. I mean, that that's a terrible message, right? I, I think... The role of, of leaders, particularly senior leaders, is actually, to your point, to change the structural policy and behavioral conditions so that they get the learning behaviors they need without people thinking it's courageous. I, that's the task. 
Now, the reality for a lot of leaders is making those changes themselves are going to require courageous action, right? So, be, so to, to be more specific, like, well, what would you have to do? Well, you probably have to be willing to say, you know what, a company that has eight levels of hierarchy when three is more than enough uh, needs to get rid of five levels of hierarchy. Well, there are going to be a lot of people upset that they lose titles in that change. Uh, you'd say, hey, you know, uh, we always hold these meetings with people three or four levels present and it's at a big rectangular table and the CEO sits at the head and the next most important people sit, you know, next to him or her on either side. And, you know, the people three or four levels down sit in the periphery in uncomfortable chairs around the wall. Well, you'd change that. Uh, you would change, uh, you would change uh, things that signal power. Like right now your office is sort of locked away on the you know top floor and I have to go through three levels of security and assistance to get to you. You'd move that office. You'd remove those barriers to seeing you. You, you would just change all these signals and symbols of power that, that create and sustain the sense that it's scary. Um, you, would, you would do things like uh, eliminate, you'd tell, you'd tell managers, I don't want to hear anybody talking anymore about their open door policy. Because an open door policy still means, I mean, you can see in my office here, right? In my office, I got my recognition plaques and awards. I have a picture of my family. Um, you know who's comfortable in my office? Me. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Uh, but, and you know, I'm sitting on my fancy Herman Miller chair or whatever, and then you come in to see me and you got to sit on the little wooden rickety one that's not comfortable at all. And so even you're, you're that... A court, they're, they're courtiers, really, is what they are, right? Yeah, right? Suppli so even, supplicants. Yeah, even the act for a manager to say I have an open door policy is essentially saying you have to, you have to start by having the courage just to come see me on my turf where I'm comfortable and you're less so. And so what I say, well, let's go back to the 1960s when the management textbooks talked about MBWA, management by walking around, right? You want to know what somebody, you know, if you will, on the floor feels, go visit them on the floor. Uh, so there are lots of things that for leaders who are serious about this, yeah, you, you're exactly right you change the conditions so that everyday learning behaviors are easier to do. You don't walk around preaching the value of courageous action. Mm -hmm. Now, in the beginning of the book, you mentioned that a lot of the stories come from students that you've had in the past. And because at the end of your class, you, you tell them, hey, I wanna hear <laughs> you know, courage in action. And I was, I was curious, well, what, what class is this, right? <laughs> what, what is the class that, that, that ends this way? Well, so initially, as I explained, I, I wrote the book because for a long time I had from the research side been thinking about, you know, yeah, we need to more understand, we need to understand courageous action more. Um, you know, I did my dissertation on why people speak up or not. I was a student at Amy Edmondson's. Uh, but it was very clear back then, this is 2001, it was very clear that there were some people who reported speaking up or somebody else speaking up even when it wasn't safe. And I knew, okay, that's a type of courageous action. And I didn't do anything with that for a long time, but I was teaching just a core leadership class. Um, this was at Cornell, MBA, exec MBAs. And at the end of every class, I would talk about, as you mentioned, this idea that, look, you know, I've put a bunch of tools in your toolkit. And if we had more time, I could throw more tools in there. There's plenty more. But I don't think it's that important. I think what'll matter is when the critical moments arrive, are you courageous enough to use the right tools? Not about the size of the toolkit, it's about your willingness to use them. And this was literally like the five minute wrap up speech to a general course on leadership, you know, 30 some hour course. And you know, people started to systematically on the eval, the post-course feedback thing, say, we need a whole module on this. We need more on this. Why isn't there a course on this? And and that that led me, after I heard that a couple years in a row, to, to go to the literature and say, well, is that true that we don't know much about this? And what I found is, yeah, from a, a sort of leadership organizational and behavior perspective, we didn't know much about it. We certainly didn't know much that was sort of helpful for folks in their shoes. And that's that was the real motive to to dig in and say, okay, you know, why is it so rare yet why are people so hungry for it why do they want concrete skills around it what what is it that we don't know and indeed that's when i 
that's when I dug in. Now, you know, if you fast forward 10 years later, now I actually teach a class called Defining Moments, um, which is uh, every case is just a page. It just very quickly says, you know, you're in this situation. This has been said or done. You have to act. What are you going to do? Um, and people prepare those on the spot. They don't have time to think it through in a big armchair fashion. And then they have to role play. They have to role play against me or the actual protagonist or actors I bring in. Um, and we use that as a, the class is a repetitive venue for, for enacting what I think is critical, which is this notion that, um, if you're going to act skillfully in high stress, emotion laden situations, you have to practice in high stress, emotion laden situations, right? Practicing in a cognitively cool manner is what a lot of us do. And it's why most of us walk out of a room after and go 30 seconds later, oh shit, I should have said this during the, yeah. um, you know, because what happens, right, is your amygdala hijacks your executive functioning. And unless we practice repetitively, trying to stay in the moment during that hijacking and tamp it down and act, we'll never just magically be skillful in those moments. Yeah, I think the French have a term. It's uh, like l'esprit de l'escalier, which is like, you know, you're leaving a party and and, and you think of some wonderful bone mow that, you know, you should have said at the moment, and but it's too late. Yeah. But, but I love it. I love this idea of practice. I mean, this is not what we typically do in, in leadership classes. I mean, I guess we do in negotiations and some other classes, but, you know, leadership is typically taught in a very abstract and, and theoretical way. We, we have experiential learning courses where you have to do some kind of consulting project or something like that, but we typically don't um, give people sort of this, this, this practice. And what, what I love about this is... Um, I always tell this story because I, th I find a lot of similarities between what you're describing in the book and what we teach venture capitalists, right, and startup entrepreneurs, which is, you know, how do you how do you de-risk it? By de-risking it, you can you can fail more often, right? And um, and I, I always tell this story about the uh, Olympic winter athletes who do the acrobatic skiing, the the OGs, the old school folks who uh, you know are in the 30s. They think it's totally unfair that a 19-year-old can win a gold medal because the only way they were able to learn back in the day was to, you know, fall on their heads and break bones. And, and now what they do is they practice with these big inflatable pillows. So, you know, you could ski down over a jump and do like a triple axel, land flat on your head, and then 30 seconds later go back up and do it again, whereas the other people would be out of commission for six months. And so it, it, it makes failure, you know, relatively inexpensive, as you're building up your, your, your muscle. And, and I think that's what you're doing here in this class is you're trying to build that, that courage muscle in a, in a low consequence environment. That's exactly right. And in fact, you know, if we, if we take that, you know, let's start where we started and then I'll take you sort of to the further along on that journey. You know, as you noted, right, uh, this came out of this realization about, you know, I put tools in your toolkit, but that won't be enough. You know, if you actually think about that, what that that describes what happens in 90 some percent of leadership courses, whether it's in academic settings or elsewhere. And really what that means is that's an indictment on us. Those of us who say we're developing leaders is that we are we're teaching you a lot of knowledge, a lot of stuff we know about the way leadership works. But we're not teaching you much at all about how to actually use these things skillfully. We're not, as you said, providing that safe practice. So, you know, for the last few years when I've been here at Darden, I've been doing this Defining Moments class. And then uh, five years ago, I developed with a colleague uh, an experiential leadership lab, and we take this to the next level. So in the experiential leadership lab, um, you're hooked up to biopack physiological tracking mm -hmm. devices. So galvanic skin response, uh, respiration, heart rate essentially various markers of sympathetic and or parasympathetic nervous system response. Uh, and we put you in high intensity, just you're the sole actor. So I'm like a class where even, you know, in my class, there's still 40 of us. This is one on one or one on two. Um, you're hooked up to this equipment. You're, you're told a quick business simulation, difficult performance evaluation or your kind shark tank pitch uh, to a couple of potential investors, you know, all of these kinds of situations. And I bring in actors from the Washington Improv Theater who enact a simulation for 15 to 30 minutes, and they are trained to create physiological arousal, to create stress. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so we create these high intensity moments. We audio visual tape, uh, audio videotape, but we also then map these physiological responses. You know, just like you see if you get a you know EKG at the doctor. Uh, and we sort of then have that played back. They self-study, they peer study. We use coaching around the video, and then we continue to teach skills. So it's a very personalized, intensive way of saying, hey, the, unfortunately, what, what we do wrong in business school context and so much other leadership development is we tell you stuff. We don't help you practice stuff. Um, and the analogy I use, you know, whether it's, you know, it's 100% accurate or not, if you think about med school, the average med school person, before they are allowed to treat patients by themselves, have something like 10 to 12 years in, in the U.S. Um, only the first 12 to 18 months is, if you will, knowledge acquisition only. So about 83% of the time that med school students spend is in right, increasingly um, less supervised practice. A huge percentage of med school, medical school is you got to get in the room with a patient. You got to diagnose in a way that you don't kill the patient at first, right? You got to diagnose, you got to try it out, you got to learn. 83% roughly of med school. 83% of business school is not about trying things out. Well, I think another concern that we might have in business school is that increasingly students are averse to discomfort, right? And it seems like, yeah. you know, I think athletes oftentimes see their heart rates go down in, in moments of high stress, which is, you know, phenomenal. But the only way to get there is to you know, go through a lot of sessions where, where the opposite is, is true. So do, do you think our, our, our students are, you know, I don't know, afraid of, of having to go through the, the kind of discomfort that is necessary to convert this from something that is, is difficult to something that's more habitual? I do. I mean, I don't want to generalize and say all students, because of course that's not true. Uh, but do I think do I think we have, you know, perhaps, you know, in the broader culture and then certainly in the higher ed culture, have we created sort of a context in which students feel the need to be sort of in performance mode to looking good mode as opposed to actually learning mode? I do think we've created that context. Mm -hmm. um, I tell my students, and and I want to be very clear. I am not in any way, shape, or form um, clueless or unsympathetic to the fact that many people have absolutely very real trauma, wounds, hurts. I know that. And, and you won't find a bigger supporter for therapy, healing, compassion than me on those issues. That said, an educational context like a business school um, cannot constantly be operating in the realm of trigger warnings and avoiding discomfort and, you know, refusing to make people uh, work at things. Because in the end, what our real job is, is to help you be more ready when you go out there to control millions or billions of dollars and hundreds or thousands of lives to be capable, to not commit malpractice. And that requires a willingness to learn. You know, your sports analogy, I think is spot on, right? Imagine you're a coach and you decide, you know, you need to introduce a new defense or some new offensive scheme, but essentially you can't because, well, you know, your players would feel bad when you had to teach them and have them try it out the first few practices, right? In that context, it would be comical to say that they didn't have to be willing to practice something they didn't know. Uh, and I think sadly, too often these days, we, we're more worried about short-term comfort than about long-term value. Yeah, I, I sometimes worry about this because, you know, I, I know that not everybody's extroverted and, and business schools sometimes reward ex, extroversion. Um, and so, you know, I have students sometimes that feel very uncomfortable when they get cold called and, and, um, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. But, but I'm also thinking, right, okay, it's precisely because you're uncomfortable that you should ask to be called on more frequently so that you can, you know, perhaps, uh, um, you know, learn to be more, more effective. Yeah. Um, I say the same thing. I mean, I, I, because as I'm sure you do, I, I will sometimes get, you know, no matter what I say, I'll sometimes get on the back end course evals that say, you know, like it was, it was too hard and I didn't feel safe and, and I'm not ex and you should have. And then, you know, as you know, the comments are, you should have called on me more. You should have pulled me in more. And my response to that is, 
When you go out there, you can't count on having a boss who in every meeting says, hey, Greg, you've been quiet today. Let's hear from you before the meeting ends, right? And so I don't want to create a false context. I don't want to create the illusion that every environment you're in, other people are going to overcome your hesitation for you. What I will do is promise you that if you work on overcoming that hesitation, I'll keep it safe for you. Now, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the, the courage ladder, right? Because this, this appears in, in the book, uh, and it's an exercise that you have people do, right? And it's almost like, um, I don't know, a fitness regime, right? <laughs> you know, where you, know, you, you have to figure out what, what, what it means to be courageous in, in your perspective, and then it turns into a series of That's right. steps, you know, go out and, and, and start climbing that ladder. Could, could you talk about how, how do people put that into practice? Yeah, sure. So... Yeah, your analogy there, I think, to sports is is really good. That's that's often the way I introduce. I say, look, you know, um, if I decided I wanted to, you know, prepare for a half a marathon, um, and I therefore said, okay, so tomorrow I'm going to put my shoes on, lace up, and I'm going to go try to run, you know, 13 miles out of the gate, you know, two things will be Two, one of two things would be true. One, I just won't put the shoes on and do it the next morning because that will be so frightening and daunting that I'll be like, no way I'm doing that. Or I will try to do it and I'll hurt myself to a level where I either don't want to or can't run again for months. And so, you know, what, what does a reasonable person do if they want to prep for a 5K or a half marathon or whatever? They undergo, you know, a many week regime where you might start as minimal as, you know, I do 10, 15 minutes of combo, walk, jog, walk, jog. You take it slow and easy. And the courage ladder concept is the same basic idea. It's derived from, you know, in psychology, exposure therapy or desensitization therapy, right? If I'm terrified of spiders or, or bees or bats or whatever, I don't go walk in there and stick my hand in the cage the first time. I, I first just get near the room, right, and walk away, right? And so the idea of the courage ladder is the same. It's to say... An intelligent person doesn't think of the scariest thing they'd like to do and go out and start there. That'll either lead to you not being willing to do it or to you failing at it. And that failure just reinforces fear. An intelligent person sort of climbs a courage ladder by saying, yeah, that's that's a 10 out of 10 in terms of fear for me. But I have some that are sevens and fives and threes and, and even twos and ones. And I'll build a ladder right, with sort of successive rungs being more fearful. And I'll start climbing from the bottom. Because on those lower, you know, those distress level twos, I actually have a reasonable chance of trying that new verbal technique I learned. Um, I probably have a chance to think through the breathing exercise I wanted to do, right? When we start at a level that's manageable, we can actually practice in a way that is productive. And what, what people find, and I've had thousands of people do this courage ladder exercise at this point, and what people find tend to be two things. You know, first of all, um, when, they, when they start at a reasonable level, they report it tends to be much less scary and go much less poor than they thought it would. In other words, it's much more manageable if you start at an appropriate place. The second thing people find over time is that you know, if they used to have a courage ladder with four activities that were a one, three, six, and nine, six months later, that six and nine also now feel like a three or a four. In other words, as you build skills through practice and, and just actually sort of comfort with being uncomfortable through practice, the actual level of fear of the same activities decreases. And I guess the third thing I would say is that what I've seen in, in organizational settings is that when leaders begin to take steps up their own courage ladder and others notice um, that becomes a model it, you know again if you go back to the sort of stop walking around encouraging courage and just sort of you know change the conditions well there's the equivalent here which is stop telling other people to walk a courage ladder just model that you're doing it yourself and soon people will be willing to do that now a lot of people are familiar with this concept of regret minimization. I think Jeff Bezos, you know, made it famous. <laughs> he talked about why he started Amazon, but but you talk about it in in a different context, right? And you say 
that people regret not doing things much more than they regret doing things. But but in this case, you're talking about doing doing the right thing, right? You know, standing up for 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 something. Um, do we have? I mean, is this is this sort of a act, affective forecasting problem? Is it just that people don't think through how they're going to view themselves later in life, how they're going to, you know, how this is going to rest with them, how this is going to sit with them? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. You know, if you can, if you think about, if you think about, so our, our evolution was to survive until we had perpetuated our genes. I mean, that is kind of the, that's the task of a human, if you will, biologically. Um, that meant it was distinctly the premium in the way we viewed the world and and sort of options in front of us it was distinctly the premium to say what will keep me alive another day not um not in 10 years how will i feel about this so i think yeah i mean we you know economists you know behavioral psychologists now have fancy terms like affective forecasting and problems with temporal discounting what are they really saying? What are we really saying when we talk about all that? What we're essentially saying is we we overweight safety and comfort in the present and we sort of underweight how we'll feel about those choices down the road. Uh, so, yeah, when we talk about regret, essentially what we're saying is that when when you ask people, you know, some number of years later, what do you wish you had done? What do you deeply regret that you didn't? Uh, a much larger percentage of what people tell you is, I should have done X. They don't tend to say nearly as often, I did X and I regret it or feel bad about it. It, it is inaction that people regret. Now, when we talk about risk taking in the business world, we, we sometimes uh, point to these you know, failure parties, right? <laughs> a lot of companies will do this where they'll, they'll celebrate failure. Um, and by celebrating failure, it makes people realize that the consequences of failure are less severe than they thought. That's but, right. But in this context, I mean, would it, would it, what, would it, what would it mean to celebrate failure in the context of doing the right thing? I mean, w w would it even make sense to throw failure parties like, hey, you know, Jim stood up to his boss and they got fired. Yay. <laughs> you know, like how would we, how would we destigmatize? Right, failure in in this context, because of the the parallels with with other types of, of risk taking. Yeah, I mean it, it's it is obviously harder to tell a hero story about Jim got fired, uh, but I think there are lots of far you know short of that there are lots of equivalent things we can do. So, you know, you're my boss. Um, I challenge you about, you know, a strategic idea or direction. You get defensive in the moment uh, and don't respond well. But you realize that you come to the next meeting and you say, hey, I want to start today mm. um, by turning back to what happened last week. And I actually want to both apologize to Jim and I want to thank Jim because I was wrong. And then in the moment, I doubled down and made it worse by responding poorly to him. Uh, when he challenged me and I really want to thank you, Jim, because if we're going to live what we say about, you know, everybody speaks their mind and challenge it, then we have to do that. And so thank you. Uh, I think it but wouldn't can, it also wouldn't would yeah. it also mean to celebrate the times where someone challenges and it turns out that there were no grounds for the challenge. But, the, you know, the, there were no consequences. It all kind of got got sorted out. Right. Because, you know, there have to be a certain number of false positives. If there aren't any false positives, then that means we probably have too too few challenges, right? So I guess there'd be there'd be circumstances where, you know, you think there's some malfeasance or whatever, or you think some poor performance, and you 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 say something, and then there's some investigation. It turns out that you know there wasn't. Like we still don't want to discourage people from from acting courageously, even when you know they're misguided, right? It's exactly right. So. And that, you know, I'll often talk about sort of celebrating the behavior, not the outcome, mm -hmm. right? So this could be, you know, like in weekly newsletters or email updates from the boss or whatever, that there is simply a notation of, hey, I want to thank Jim for helping us to investigate, blah, blah, blah. We're now looking into the issue. You don't say anything about whether it turns out Jim's a right. positive or not, right? You simply say it's the behavior that we want to celebrate. Because I think that's right. And in fact, I think one of the 
one of the the mistakes I've heard leaders make over the years, they say, well, you know, people speak up all the time and sometimes they're not right. And, they're, and what I say is, well, look, I can present you a lot of evidence where people withheld critical information that did great harm <laughs> to the organization and and lots of data that say this is what was, you know, when somebody did speak up and gets ignored, this is harm or loss that occurred. I've never yet seen a study that says an organization's well-being was harmed because you had too much voice, because there are some false positives. So, you know, when somebody convinces me that the problem is too much voice, okay, then I'll change my view on this. But so far, nobody has ever given me that data. Mm-hmm. Well, Jim, thanks so much for joining me. I, I, I look forward to the day when, when business schools will, will be kind of, you know, like these character gyms, right? Because I always like to say that you go to business school to become a more effective individual. And, and obviously that, that can't happen if all you're doing is, is learning theory, right? You know, you have to actually get some, some practice with, with action. And, Amen. And, I think, and you uh, know, if, if chat GPT is teaching us anything, it's that the days of needing to go to business school to learn facts is quickly coming to an end. It's got to be all about these interpersonal behaviors. Right. You might have learned fact checking. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but that, that's a lot less work. Uh, so thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. The book here is called uh, Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. Check it out. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.